Before I start talking about Jewish history proper, I thought it would be helpful to discuss that history has always been shaped by factors like geography, climate, and language. The land comprising present-day Israel and its neighbors is located on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Geologically, it's actually part of the African Plate, and it's that geological separation from Arabia that's responsible for creating the extreme rift valley that includes the Dead Sea, as well as the high mountains on either side. For obvious reasons, it was the first place where modern humans arrived after leaving Africa, so the archaeological record here goes back incredibly far, and we're always finding more. A lot of what we find in the early record resembles finds all over Europe and Asia like fertility idols, but toward the end of the last ice age, the first signs appear of a distinct regional culture. This original culture called Natufian is notable in recent years for upending a lot of anthropologists' preconceptions about how societies evolved, because all evidence suggests that the Natufians adopted a sedentary lifestyle thousands of years before developing agriculture. This gives credence to the idea that cities originated as a means of defense rather than trade, and it's a testament to how lush and fertile the coastal region of West Asia was and still is. If you're my age or older, you probably learned at some point about the Fertile Crescent, a region spanning modern-day Mesopotamia and the Levant that spawned early agriculture and city development. The problem with this concept is that while Israel and Mesopotamia are indeed both fertile, they aren't fertile for the same reasons. For one, contrary to your 6th grade ancient history textbook, the Jordan is not a major river like the Tigris or Euphrates. In most seasons, it's shallow and narrow enough to walk across, and while an important source of drinking water, it is not adequate for wide-scale irrigation. And as the Natufian culture demonstrated, you didn't need wide-scale irrigation to develop a complex society here because unlike Mesopotamia and Egypt, the Levant isn't a desert. For that misconception, we can probably thank 19th century photographers, who had the misfortune to be the first to document the Holy Land after centuries of deforestation and soil erosion from which it still hasn't fully recovered. As recently as the First Crusade, the Judean mountains and Sharon Plain would have more closely resembled modern Israel, with extensive mixed forests, meadows, and close-knit farmsteads. That's because, like most of the Mediterranean, Israel is located in the subtropics, where the prevailing wind changes direction seasonally, as well as having a large ocean to its west and a large continent to its east. Commonly known as a Mediterranean climate, the result is that cold, temperate winter storms from the Atlantic hit with full force, while hot, tropical summer storms from the east run out of energy long before they can even get close. Other places with wet winter, dry summer climates include California, as well as parts of Chile, Australia, and South Africa, all places notable for developing sedentary societies without intensive agriculture. But because Israel was right next to Egypt and Mesopotamia, it meant that those agrarian societies had an instant market for exporting their surplus grain. And when Israel did adopt agriculture, its farmers could focus on more specialized crops like fruits and vegetables and wine. Without having to produce all your own food, an unusually dry winter didn't have to wipe you out. In fact, droughts made for better, more valuable wine, so your population could become bigger and wealthier and more specialized. And because the Mediterranean is relatively small and enclosed with regularly shifting seasonal winds and minimal turbulence, mutual trade could sustain and develop water-scarce cultures all over the region, from the Etruscans to the Greeks to the Hittites to the Semites, who displaced the Natufian culture around the end of the last Ice Age. So why does this matter to understanding Jewish history? Well, for most people in the modern age, the Jewish story has been told by non-Jews for non-Jews, and accordingly it has been continually reshaped and recontextualized by politics and prejudice and taking the biblical narrative at face value. But Judaism didn't come down from Mount Sinai. It grew up organically from the soil. When the Jewish people first emerged as a distinct nation at the beginning of the Iron Age, they were keenly aware of the fragile interconnectedness in which they were able to live. That's why so much of the Torah deals with rules for farming and forestry. It's why environmentalism is a universally accepted aspect of being Jewish, with an entire holiday dedicated to planting trees. And it's why many Orthodox Jews today feel they can't be fully observant unless they return to the land of their ancestors. It made us who we are. Hey, thanks for checking out this video. It will be the first of many on Jewish history. If you want to support this channel, you can check out my Patreon page, which is linked in the description below. Or simply like, share, and subscribe. This video was written, illustrated, and performed by me, Sam Arano. Today's background image was an apartment in Old Jaffa, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. I will see you next time.